Hey everyone, welcome to another lecture in your series for endocrine disorders. Today we're going to be looking at briefly your thyroid diseases as well as some of the medications that are used to treat those diseases. So without any further ado, let's begin. So before I talk about the medications, I thought it'd be a good idea to just briefly summarize how these hormones are actually created, mainly because um, some of the mechanisms of actions of the drugs rely on a good understanding of some of the enzymes and steps that are involved. So I know um, it's really, really annoying when I tell you that you need to memorize an entire pathway of reactions. But I think that when it comes to thyroid hormone synthesis, this is one of those things that's actually very useful to know, just again, for the mechanism of action. So essentially, if you look at the leftmost diagram, you can see that it shows the steps that are taken to produce your thyroid hormones. You start off on the leftmost side with your dietary iodide, the one that you eat in your food that enters into your follicular cells. Um, they don't really do anything inside there. Essentially, they just get pumped into the lumen. In the lumen, you get the iodination and coupling of tyrosine. So essentially, you end up with T3, T4. They kind of just bind together. You get It gets uh, packaged into a colloid, which you might notice on histology, those little fatty uh, circles when you have a histological slide of the thyroid gland. Um, once they go closer and closer to the capillary, before they've entered the capillary, uh, they'll get proteolized. So then the T3 and T4 get separated back again. They enter the blood and then they go to whatever tissue they need to exert their actions. So essentially the ones that I want you to be really, um, I want you to really know about are going to be the iodination step as well as the proteolysis step, because that's where a lot of these mechanisms of action are, are relevant. Now, just very briefly, again, looking at the T4 and T3 hormones, the main hormones that are produced by the gland. T4 is thyroxine. So it's generally the, so it's the inactive form. It's the one that's converted into T3 by this deiodinase enzyme, which I'll discuss in a sec. It's got the longer half-life. So essentially you think it's the inactive form. It's got the longer half-life, which means it has a larger plasma pool. Uh, the T3 hormone, so triiodothyronine, that's the one that, because it's not as strongly bound to the, uh, the TPG plasma proteins, it has a much shorter half-life. However, it is the one that exerts a lot more action. So it's four times more potent than T4 when it binds to the receptor. However, it has a smaller plasma pool. So essentially, all you're thinking is you've got T4 enzyme. That's the one that's produced, uh, the thyroid gland produces more of. It's the uh, stable form. It's inactive. It has a longer half-life. It find its way to the peripheral tissues. That's where it gets converted into T3, which is the really excited, um, potent one, but it has a much shorter half-life, okay? And it has a smaller amount in the body. In terms of that conversion, the deiodinase enzymes is the one that does that. And once it's converted into T3, the active form, it enters into the cells to the intracellular receptor, which you can see is labeled THR, the so thyroid hormone receptor, which uh, initiates some of these SNS-like effects. Essentially, you have increased rate of metabolism, okay? And we've discussed some of the effects, for example, on heart rate, digestion, and all those things in another lecture, if you'd like to refresh your memory. Now, in terms of the pathologies, you know, there are kind of broadly two classes of thyroid diseases that you need to be aware of. Um, and it's to do with the type of secretion. So hypothyroidism is too much secretion of hormone. Hypothyroidism will be too little hormone secretion. Within them, there are you know, roughly three sort of categories that you should be aware of at this stage. You've got your diffuse toxic goiter. And actually, sorry, before I do that, there's um, one category that's not really mentioned here, which is just like the simple goiter. So it's just like one little uh, mass that's on the thyroid gland. It doesn't really fit into either of these, but I thought I'd just mention it. When we get to this, it's a bit more complicated. So diffuse toxic goiter, essentially there's not just one little spot, it's uh, a goiter or an inflammation or an enlargement of the entire thyroid gland. That is most commonly Graves' disease. Um, this is an autoimmune condition. So you essentially have the production of TSHRAB. I know it's a long name, but it's really important you remember this for investigations. It is the TSH receptor antibody. Interestingly, most antibodies that are produced, you know, like the body produces antibodies so that they can flag it to the immune cells to destroy. But in this case, the antibodies are actually stimulatory. So they stimulate the TSH receptor to keep on uh, producing or uh, basically keep on acting, which will essentially lead to too much production of those hormones. Okay. So it's just a really important exception to remember. You've also got the toxic multinodular goiter. So instead of the whole uh, thyroid gland being um, enlarged, there are multiple little nodules that are, occur like generally across the whole thyroid gland. 
which is known as Plummer's disease. And essentially, um, most commonly arises from a long-standing simple goiter, which I discussed before. And usually it happens in elderly patients, very, very low yield, but it's just there in case, you know, it's mentioned somewhere. And then you've also got the toxic nodular goiter or sometimes called toxic adenoma. So essentially just a single nodule, which produces an excess amount of hormone. And then in hypothyroidism, you've got again, an autoimmune uh, variation, which is known as Hashimoto's disease. Um, in this case, it produces an antibody, which is destructive. So the TPOAB or thyroid peroxidase antibody, essentially uh, destroy or leads to the destruction of that specific enzyme, which leads to reduced production of the thyroid hormones. Um, just as a note, the Graves disease and Hashimoto's disease, they're the most uh, common diagnoses in each of these categories. So if you have a patient, for example, with hypothyroidism, most of those patients will have Hashimoto's and then the remainder will have the other types. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, the other cases are also quite common though. So iatrogenic, in it, essentially stuff that happens because of our interventions, um, includes thyroidectomy, so removal of part or the entire thyroid gland, radioiodine, which we'll discuss a little bit later, lithium or some medications like amiodarone. Um, you may remember amiodarone when we were discussing antiarrhythmics, and I probably mentioned in that lecture somewhere that amiodarone has a lot of really nasty side effects. One of them is hypothyroidism. You then have also have iodine deficiency. So of course, uh, if we go back to our um, part, whoops, if we go back to our pathway, we know that iodine is uh, really, really required to be able to actually, or it's a, um, it's a precursor to be able to produce these uh, T3, T4 hormones. So if you don't have any iodine coming through in our diet, then we're not going to have enough of these hormones being produced. Um, you can also think about it as the fact that uh, if you have um, two, if you have too little T3, T4, you will also have an excessive secretion of TSH because of negative feedback. So it's, I, I haven't really mentioned it. I haven't put a diagram of it in our, or in this slides here, but in your thyroid specific slides, you may have a diagram that shows that this all has a negative feedback mechanism. And it's the same for pretty much most hormones in the body. Okay, so you want to remember that if your T3, T4 hormones reduce, then your TSH and the upstream regions will increase and then the other way around as well. This is very, very important and critical when we get to investigations, because sometimes in exams, you might just get um, a patient's blood results and it will show their T3, T4 levels as well as the TSH levels. And you should be able to distinguish whether it's firstly hyper or hypothyroidism. And secondly, whether it's um, a pathology that's arising from the thyroid gland itself, otherwise known as uh, primary hyper or hypothyroidism, or whether it's something a bit more upstream, like a secondary or tertiary condition. So I've put a little diagram here from um, Geeky Medics, and you know, there's uh, probably a hundred variations on this diagram, but I thought this one is a, a nice and simple one that shows the main characteristics. So essentially, um, the two main tests that you're doing is for serum uh, T4 and serum TSH. Uh, if you look at the diagram, if you try and just follow one branch of it, it'll sort of make sense. So for example, if we look at the leftmost branches, if you look at TSH levels, it is increased. And then if you also look at T4 levels, or actually maybe let's focus on a simple one. So let's say, let's say uh, T4 levels are reduced. Okay, just say T4 levels are reduced. Now, because that means that we have less thyroid hormone, that is a hypothyroidism. But I want to know, did that hypothyroidism arise because of some sort of problem in the thyroid gland itself? Or was it a problem that was somewhere more upstream? Okay, like a pituitary problem. To do that, I need to look at TSH. Because if it was a thyroid problem, what I would expect is that if I have a low uh, T4, it would lead to a negative feedback loop that goes up to the pituitary and leads to more secretion of TSH. Because of course, the pituitary in that case is not affected. However, if the problem is actually in the pituitary itself, if I have low T4 and there's negative feedback, the pituitary is not going to be able to increase its TSH secretion because it's the one that's the problem. So we'll have low T4 and low TSH. So I want you to think about it like that. Like, yes, you can uh, take this diagram, memorize it, and then regurgitate it when you get to the exam. But it's often just easier to remember it in terms of the negative feedback because it all makes intuitive sense. The only things that can be a little bit confusing are when it gets to like the subclinical place. So like you might have um, increased TSH, but maybe your T4 is still normal. And essentially what that means is that you're transitioning from a normal state to a hypo or hyperthyroidic state. Um, but that is very low yield and it's 
actually not that important because oftentimes a subclinical diagnosis, yes, while it's important to know, you probably won't do many interventions, okay? So as long as you know this flow chart um, and you can sort of logic through it, that's very good. Some additional tests, which are quite common, would be the antibodies. So you're looking for that TPOAB for Hashimoto's, TSHRAB, which is for the um, Graves disease. And an additional one that is just interesting to know is the TG antibody, which is for thyroid cancers. And then imaging, um, again, very, very common. So you might do a Doppler ultrasound. And in anatomy, you might look at ultrasounds of the neck when you get to head and neck and you will see the thyroid gland in all its glory. You can also have a look at radioactive iodine scans. So sometimes when you have these multinodular goiters or uh, toxic adenomas, um, you will actually see like little hot spots on the thyroid gland because those areas, because they are essentially hyper-functioning, uh, they will have a lot more metabolic demand. They will take up that iodine much quicker than the rest of it. So all the thyroid gland will be cold essentially apart from those hot spots. Um, if you're interested, have a look at a diagram. It looks really cool, but again, not too important for you to understand at this stage. Now we get to the actual pharmacology. So we're looking at the treatment options for hyperthyroidism first, arguably the more important one to know. Um, if we look at firstly the reversible agents, so some of the medications that you would use, the most important drug class here is the thionamides. And um, the two medications that come under this are carbimazole and propyl thiouracil. How do they work? They inhibit the iodination of tyrosine, sorry, uh, tyrosine on thyroglobulin, which therefore reduces the uh, production of T3 and T4. So essentially we are impacting on this stage at the bottom here. So step number four, if you can't see my cursor, you're preventing the iodine from actually even binding to that thyroglobulin. So you don't end up with any T3, T4 being produced. Um, some nice sort of facts to know is that it is orally active. You, get, you do get a really good uh, fraction of inhibition in 12 hours, so 90%, that is pretty fast, but the full effect, so you know, 99, 100% inhibition, that can take weeks. So you, you need to be on this medication for quite some time. Um, and the uses for this is often uh, pre-surgery. You might want to reduce the, the size of the gland so that it's easier to resect it. Um, so you can use this medication for that, or it can also just be long-term treatment. Uh, which you can use instead of these other irreversible agents, which I will talk about later. Another medication or I guess uh, class would be just administering excess iodide. And you might be wondering, wait, 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 that doesn't make sense, right? Because iodine or iodide is like the, it's the precursor for T3, T4. So if I make, if I uh, inject more, or I give them more, then it's not going to lead to more T3, T4 production. And yes, that logic is correct. Um, but actually, this is one of those weird instances where giving the iodide will actually uh, damage the tissue more or it will lead to reduced uh, production. And I'm sure there's a, like a, a beautiful explanation somewhere out there in terms of why that's the case. I couldn't find anything, but if you get your hands on it, please send it to me. Um, I just remember that it's one of those counterintuitive uh, medications. So it's very useful for the transient treatment of hypothyroidism, generally because uh, you know, for between 10 to 14 days, you get a reduction in size, but it's temporary. So it's not going to last uh, for as long as say the thionamides, which is why the thionamides are, are generally the, the first line medication. It's again, really useful to prepare for surgical resection. So to reduce the size, or you can also use it acutely during a thyroid storm. So thyroid storm, as the name suggests, is if you have a patient who has really bad hypothyroidism, and they are producing a huge amount of T3, T4, they're becoming hypermetabolic and that's not good because you can get like arrhythmias and all sorts of bad stuff. Um, you can also give it as prophylaxis for, uh, prophylaxis for patients who are going to get radioactive iodide a little bit later. Um, and it's shown to reduce the, um, the incidence of like thyroid cancers and stuff like that. But again, it's just an interesting fact to know. What is actually really important to know is that with thionamides, um, there are a bunch of adverse effects that you should be aware of um, for your exams, as well as if you get to a stage where you're administering them. So firstly, uh, these medications can cross the placenta and also enter breast milk. So if you've got um, uh, like a, a, a fetus or you've got a baby um, and you've got their mother who is on these thionamide medications, it can actually lead to an increased incidence of congenital hypothyroidism. Because essentially you're shutting down the little baby's thyroid gland before it's even born. And so it can lead to fetal goiters and all sorts of uh, bad outcomes for the baby. 
Now, the propyl thiouracil is a lot safer than carbamazole because it crosses the um, placenta less. So it's not able to diffuse as much. Uh, you just still have to be a bit more careful, if that makes sense. And the reason why I say that is because um, even excess iodide, I'm pretty sure is contraindicated in um, pregnant patients. But I, I think like best case scenario, propyl thiouracil is uh, your safest bet. Carbamazole and excess iodide, probably not. Other adverse effects are rashes, headaches, nausea, jaundice, joint pain. So, um, you know, it's very, very problematic. Um, but it can also lead to this thing called agranulocytosis, which is just when you're not able to produce granulomas or like when you've got an infection, these granulomas are really nice ways for your body to uh, wall in these um, pathogens. So you have very low white blood cells um, and that's not good because you can have increased incidence of infection. So essentially when you administer these, just let the patient know that if you start to develop a rash, you start to develop a fever, headaches, um, just sore throat, whatever, that you should come back to the doctor immediately. Because while this is very, very dangerous, the fact that they are, I guess, sort of immunocompromised, it is something that's quite reversible and easy to manage if it is spotted early. Irreversible agents, um, obviously, you know, gold standard is removal of the thyroid gland, but if you can avoid it, why not? Uh, one of the agents that you can use is radioactive iodine. So that's uh, the 131 isotope. A um, bit of chemistry, but again, not important to know. It's given orally and it emits beta particles, which have a localized cytotoxic action on the tissue. So it, and essentially it's damaging the tissue. Uh, the radioactivity disappears in two months because the half-life is eight days. So essentially you're going to be um, emitting these beta particles. Like while you're emitting them mostly in the uh, thyroid gland, because these iodine molecules they mostly get concentrated in the thyroid. They have no other place to be. Um, you still are recommended to sleep alone and distance or like try not to stay too close to many people at a time because there is a chance that you can, those beta particles can somehow transmit to other people. Um, it has a slightly delayed effect though because you do have a very large endogenous store of thyroid hormone within your thyroid glands. So yeah, it takes a little bit of time for firstly those uh, hormones to deplete before this actually has some sort of uh, meaningful uh, action, if that makes sense. So these are your reversible and irreversible agents. The main thing that you need to be uh, wary of is the adverse effects of these thionamides, especially carbimazole. Uh, gold standard treatment for hypothyroidism is gonna be your hormone supplementation, which makes sense. If you don't have enough T3, uh, T4, give them those, those hormones. So most of the time you give them T4 supplementation, which is levothyroxine. And it's pretty much the only effective treatment that we have for hypothyroidism. It is used orally and it has a peak effect in 10 days. Uh, duration is about three weeks. So, you know, quite good, lasts for a long time. In, in, in slightly older patients, you, you might want to titrate the dose up because you, you want to avoid the uh, unwanted cardiac symptoms of like hypothyroidism. So in a hypothyroid uh, case, you will have you know, reduced heart rate, which can in very elderly patients can lead to like heart failure and you know, it's not a good outcome. So you might want to titrate it up or in other words, increase it so that you're able to avoid that situation in an elderly patient. However, because there's a negative feedback, if you supplement someone with T4, it will lead to a reduction in TSH produced by the pituitary. And TSH is something that helps to maintain bone. If you remember back to um, uh, bone lectures, I'm sure you've had some, um, which can lead to osteoporosis. So again, elderly patients, yes, you want to titrate it up, but be wary of the fact that you can lead to brittle bones. And this is a very vulnerable population. Note that like I did say T4, but there are T3 supplements that are available. But because I said that they have a shorter half-life, they're more potent, um, it's not going to last as long as these T4 supplements will. However, if you have a patient that goes into a myxedema coma, in other words, they become way too hypothyroidic, then you can actually give these T3 supplements to be able to reverse that quickly. Otherwise, for long-term treatment, you want to only be administering T4. Uh, so uh, on the right-hand side, I just put your core medications from e-pharmacology. There's only two, really. You've got carbimazole. Um, which I've already talked about before, main things are the adverse effects. Levothyroxine is essentially everything I've written here. Um, it's very simple, right? Because you're just supplementing the hormone that is missing from these patients. And I've just included a diagram of um, how those 
like carbamazole, propyl thiouracil, as well as that excess um, iodide work. They essentially act at the spot where, uh, or I, I, I put a simplified diagram on the first slide, but they essentially act at the spot where you get that iodination and then you're not able to produce any T3, T4 anymore. All right. So that's it for uh, thyroid disease and thyroid medications. Um, I hope that was instructive. And if you do have any questions, please let me know. This was a slightly simpler lecture. Um, I know that in the grand scheme of things, pharmacology is very, very big. And you, know, you might only have two medications here that you really need to remember, but um, you're gonna have so many more medications in other sections, not just in endo, you will have stuff for all the systems that you cover. So I know it can be quite overwhelming, but um, a couple of things I'd recommend is first try and make your job easier by having like mnemonics or uh, memory devices that you can use. Um, in my notes, um, if you are using that or have access to it, I would recommend looking at the list of medications that I have. Um, I have like a, <clears throat> a large list from year one and year two. And within each of those pages, there will be a little mnemonic or memory device that I use. I can't guarantee that all of them are appropriate just because um, oftentimes the human brain latches onto things that are a little bit strange or sometimes even vulgar, but yeah, uh, you've been warned. Um, try and develop your own things because it'll just take that load off your brain and you only need to remember it for the exams. Once you get into the clinical years, you'll remember it just by, uh, you know, seeing those medications in clinical practice. For now, just try and get them in your head as best as you can. As always, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to answer anything. I know you're approaching your mid-year exam, so it's a stressful time. So if there's questions about anything, please, please, please don't hesitate to send me a message. Um, this is probably our last week of videos until semester two. So uh, do let us know if you want us to give you more quizzes and stuff like that. But you know, other than that, best of luck. Um, I hope to see more of you in person in semester two, if possible. Um, but I will see you then. All right. Bye-bye.